Welcome to Diagnosing Healthcare, a podcast featuring thought-provoking conversations about the latest legal, policy, and regulatory issues in healthcare. While these issues may seem like hurdles, we'll also look at the business opportunities and solutions that exist. Diagnosing Healthcare is brought to you by the healthcare lawyers at Epstein Becker Green, a leading law firm that has more than 40 years experience serving clients in the healthcare industry nationwide. Today on Diagnosing Healthcare, we discuss government enforcement of information blocking, the complaint process, and data generated through that process to date. Hello, and welcome to our special series on interoperability. I'm your host, Nivedita Patel. I'm an attorney in Epstein, Becker, and Greed's healthcare and life sciences practice based out of our Washington, D.C. office. Information blocking is the generally prohibited act of interfering with the access or exchange of electronic health information by certain actors in the healthcare industry. Since the rules compliance dates in 2021, how have complaints of information blocking been submitted to ONC and by whom? What does enforcement action really look like? On today's show, we will speak to ONC attorneys to better understand the formal information blocking complaint process, trends ONC has observed, and how those complaints could lead to enforcement action. I want to hand things over to my colleague, Alan Kilworth, a member of the firm in Epstein, Becker, and Green's Columbus office. Alan helps hospitals and healthcare facilities navigate a wide range of federal and state regulatory issues, including those related to health information and data exchange. Thanks, Nevaitha. This is Alan Kilworth. I'm excited to be speaking today with Cassie Weaver and Rachel Nelson from the Office of National Coordinator. Rachel and Cassie were the authors of a post on the Health IT Buzz blog titled Information Blocking Claims by the Numbers, which discussed the first data available related to the complaints received by ONC regarding information blocking. Welcome, Rachel and Cassie, and thank you for joining us. Thank you for having us. Glad to be here. I'm Rachel Nelson. I lead the compliance and administration branch in ONC's Office of Policy, Regulatory and Policy Affairs Division. Information blocking is not all we do, but it's what we do a lot, and it's what we're here to talk about today. Cassie? Hi, thanks, Alan, for having us and glad to be here. My name is Cassie Weaver, and I work in Rachel's branch as a policy analyst, and I do primarily work on information blocking. It is also not all I do, but sometimes it feels like it. So very happy to be here and excited to get this discussion started. Well, great. Thanks so much again for being here. We really appreciate it. Before we get into the discussion, I was going to give just a little bit of background, picking up on what Nevedetha mentioned in the introduction, just a level set and make sure that our audience has a full understanding of the details of the information blocking rule that are relevant to our discussion today. The actors that are subject to the information blocking rules are healthcare providers, developers of certified health IT, and health information networks or exchanges. And if an actor interferes with or inhibits access or exchange of electronic health information, that actor can be subject to enforcement. Enforcement against developers and HIEs is by the Office of Inspector General, and they have issued a proposed rule back in April of 2020 that would impose civil monetary penalties up to a million dollars for a violation of the information blocking rule. No rule has been issued yet by HHS regarding disincentives for healthcare providers as the third category of actors. But HHS is authorized by the Cures Act to develop such rules in the future. So with that in mind, we wanted to discuss the complaint process, which is also authorized by the Cures Act statute, for there to be a standardized process by which complaints regarding these acts of information blocking could be reported. Cassie and Rachel, could one of you just give us an overview of the ONC complaint process generally? Sure. In that Cures Act, which was passed by Congress in 2016, a really bipartisan bill, lots of support for it, Congress directed ONC to implement a standardized process for the public to report claims of information blocking, and also gave, as you mentioned, HHS Office of Inspector General the authority to investigate those claims. So we set up a portal that allows members of the public, anyone can submit an information blocking claim to come and sort of describe what happened. We take those complaints when they come in and we send them to OIG. The only situation in which we wouldn't send one is like a complete wrong number or a spam submission, but we're not looking at them to see has information blocking occurred here or anything like that? It's really just a very cursory sort of, does this you know, look like an information blocking claim at all? And if it does, we send it to OIG because OIG has the authority to investigate. So once we get that claim, we do confirm receipt of it with the submitter. Claims can be submitted anonymously, but that makes it 
actually impossible for us to get in contact with you if we ever need more information about it. So we do hope folks will consider not submitting anonymously. And one thing that can maybe reassure people about that is that the CARES Act also said that any potentially identifying information from these claims is not subject to FOIA. So it will be kept confidential. Cassie, you mentioned follow-up with a report. Can you just describe in what instance a follow-up might be? The, the FAQs on ONC's website for the information blocking FAQs does give some information about a follow-up call or, or conversation that ONC might initiate related to a complaint. Sure. This actually gets into sort of ONC's separate authority. While OIG has the authority to investigate claims of information blocking against all actors, separately under ONC's certification program for health IT, one of the requirements of that program is that health IT developer of certified health IT, not information block. And so when we get a complaint that is about a certified health IT developer, we also have some authority to investigate that. And so it's possible when that happens, that we could reach out to the submitter to try to get some more information to see, you know, if this is something that the certification program can look into. And that's totally separate and not subject to million dollar penalties there. Yeah, I think I think I'll also add that in addition to what Cassie excellently summarized about the parallel authority when it comes to particularly information blocking we did set up the process to recognize that it's entirely possible that when someone submits to us a claim or suggestion of what they think should be information blocking or might be information blocking in the fact pattern they lay out for us, we may see things that may suggest a certified health IT product or developer is not meeting other certification program requirements. And we would be able to use the contact information in those situations where we feel like we should learn more about what's really going on here, we would be able to use that to look at other potential, we call them non-conformities under the program, to certification program requirements. But that is limited you know, to certified health IT and whether the product should continue to be certified health IT. That's really helpful. Outside of that authority and the certified health IT developers, just for a provider, for example, if the complaint was about a provider, is there a process by which they ONC follows up with a report just because it has incomplete information or it needs additional data? Or does it just take what's received? Yeah, we just take what's received. If it's not an actor over whom we have authority, the certified health IT developers, then it's completely within OIG's authority to follow up on anything. And so they get all that information. They're able to follow up as they deem fit, basically. So Okay. So in, And then when that information is received by ONC, does ONC look for anything? I know the investigation authority is under the OIG's purview, but does ONC filter it at all, for example, look to see if an exception applies or anything of that nature? We don't. No, we really just look to see is an actor mentioned? Does it appear to involve EHI? And does it seem like there's some sort of interference? And if any one of those three are even, you know, just the bottom line barely met, we'll share it because we don't want to, you know, miss something that could be information blocking, but we also just don't have the authority to dig into it, to look at exceptions or anything like that. That will all be OIG doing that. So let's walk through some of the complaint data that has been made available, um, which is really helpful uh, information, frankly, for everyone to have. And I'll start by mentioning that the original blog post we referenced that was issued posted back in February, had information through that date, but ONC has uh, data that's fairly frequently updated. Currently, as of the recording of this podcast, the data is available through June 30th, 2022. How often does the data on the website get updated? Our normal process is monthly. Since we're having informal conversation, I'll go ahead and add the caveat. There's obviously always a potential for a system to not be functioning exactly like we need it to or something else to slow us down. We may not always hit the time frames that we default to. But when we're able to sort of maintain our usual cadence, you should probably expect to see an update for what we get through the last day of July coming online sometime in early August. If you're updating in that schedule, it's pretty it's pretty current information. And again, I think it's very useful to look through it. It's very helpful, including the way that it's laid out on the, uh, the on the ONC website. When you look at that data, you can see the types of complaints by claimant, who's filing the complaints, and then against which kind of actor the complaints are getting fi- filed. 
And and can you just describe that information? Who are most complaints being filed against at this time? The majority of the complaints are being filed against healthcare providers by patients. And I know Rachel would like to join me in making sure we make it really clear that that doesn't necessarily mean that the most information blocking is happening between patients and their healthcare providers. It could be that patients are the most informed about this or the most likely to, you know, figure out a way to find the government agency that they need to complain to about it, and that they also might not all be information blocking in the end, an exception could apply, an investigation would be needed to know if it is actually an information blocking complaint. But the majority of them have come from patients and are against healthcare providers. It's interesting data. The, you know, there was some thought that patients might be the least informed about this because they aren't subject to the rules themselves. They haven't had a couple of years of prepping for these rules, whereas folks in the industry, the actors have. But it does look like from the data that patients are aware of this process, which is the whole point of the complaint process. But as of today, uh, it looked like 302 out of 459 uh, complaints were either from a patient or on behalf of the patient based on the categorization that's available through that data. So that's a, that's a substantial you know, majority of, of the complaints. There's a separate category for attorney, and those are also, if I'm correct, exclusively patient complaints that are submitted on behalf by their attorney. Is that right? Not necessarily. That attorney label is actually added to a claim in addition to one of the other types of claimant categories. So if a claim is submitted by someone describing themselves as an attorney on behalf of the client who's a patient, it will be counted in both the patient and the attorney type of claimant categories. Or if it's an attorney representing the parent of a patient, it would be counted in both the attorney and the third party on behalf of a patient category. So that's really sort of a descriptive tag that we put on those claims just to get an idea of how frequently attorneys are submitting these claims. In theory, you know, and I have not seen the data lately, I will say that the attorney label could also be applied to a claim where an attorney submits the claim on behalf of a healthcare provider client. So let's say the provider has a concern about their um, health IT developer, that particular claim would be tagged as coming from the healthcare provider and it would get the additional tag of an attorney. You mentioned complaints from providers. It does, there as of today anyway, there were 50 identified as complaints being submitted by providers, not against providers, but submitted by providers. Can you describe, if possible, what one of those might look like when a provider is alleging uh, another actor of information blocking? Is there some general information you can give about what those complaints kind of look like? So I think that's getting that's starting to get into a place where we're going to need to be careful and speak about, and, and I'll go ahead and, and set it up, remembering that these are, in the words of the statute, claims or suggestions of possible information blocking. You know, I think on their face, they are what they are. On their face, we often don't know a lot of information. The claimant can only give us what they have, obviously. So when it would come to investigation time, let's say it's a provider concerned with something that a health information network is doing, OIG would need to go in and do the investigation to figure out what really happened here and see both sides to get get from both sides the full facts of the situation. So with mandatory sort of disclaimers and (laughs) caveats out of the way, one of the good things about these claims as a data source is that they give us a little bit of a sense of where people are experiencing friction with interoperability and information exchange, regardless of whether they are or are not information blocking, they are still something that the person felt was not how things should be. And they felt strongly enough, this is not something I should be experiencing, that they reported it to us as a claim of possible information blocking. So that said, I think rather than talking about you know a typical claim or trying to put out a hypothetical claim we're kind of going to do the same thing that we did in the blog which is talk about you know examples of trends or examples of sort of themes things we've seen more than once we hear providers being concerned about fees that they're surprised by when they ask their health IT developer to do something that pertains to moving EHI somewhere 
we see providers being concerned by how much things cost and maybe not surprised necessarily, but just they think it's really way higher than it should be for what it is. And without going in there, again, we have no idea whether this would legally be considered information blocking, but we can tell that is one of the themes, I would say, of where people are experiencing frustration. If there's a more interesting example in there, I really can't give it because at this low number of total claims in the database, we have to be very, very careful not to say something that seems de-identified, but that could either accurately or inaccurately be inferred. You know, someone out there could infer who complained about whom based on what they hear happen, what they've seen happen. And we want to be very, very careful that we're not disclosing any information that could lead to the identification accurately of who's submitting these claims. But also, we don't really want people inaccurately identified as information blocking claimants either. Those are two themes that come to my mind that I've seen both in the claims and I'll say in questions that they ask as questions separately, that those are some, those are two friction points that I think providers are telling us they're experiencing. That's interesting. That's helpful information. That's really what I was hoping to to discuss and do find that there might be some value, I think, to people looking at that data as well outside of ONC as actors of, of what whether those or what those trends and themes might be. As you continue to collect this data and get more of it and a larger sample size, will additional information be provided about that? As you mentioned, there was some limited information on the blog about those trends and themes based on the limited sample size. Is it possible that that data will be further analyzed and further described in additional publications? It's possible. You know, it's a really little sample. As data goes, and I'm, I'm going to take point on this and then let Cassie follow up, but as an unashamed kind of data nerd, this is really interesting and I can geek out about the qualitative things that we can see in it. But as a data set goes, this is really, really tiny. And so I think we we want to proceed with caution and not do what a doctor friend of mine used to always call overdrive our headlights when it comes to how far the evidence we have lets us actually see down the road. So I think it's one of those things where we anticipate doing what we can do with the data as the data set matures, you know, and as we learn more through more claims, you know, if more people submit more information within the claims, that would maybe help us get a richer data set and closer to where we would have something that would be publishable, I would say on its own. I believe we have an article in the works that's actually going to be about a survey data set in which we might mention this as an additional data set, but I have not, I'm not one of the listed authors. I have not seen the draft, but it, it's possible that it could be mentioned in a, I'll call it a formal, say, peer-reviewed publication, even though in, in the near future, though, again, that publication would be focusing more on survey results. Yeah, I was going to add a couple of things. One goes back to when we were talking about those provider complaints. And I think you gave a couple good examples, but I did want to mention too that they aren't only against health IT developers of certified health IT. There's also providers saying, hey, we can't get our patient's information from another provider. So there is still that sort of records access problem that we're seeing that, you know, we've noticed ever since. ONC wrote the information blocking report to Congress. It was that, you know, those trends have have borne out in our tickets. The other thing I would say about releasing more information in the future is that being open with this data and information that we have is really important to ONC. We want people to know what we're doing and what we're seeing. We're limited only in the fact that this is a very small data set that we can't release any information that could even just potentially identify a claimant. And that as OIG investigates claims, then there's certain things we won't just be able to discuss because OIG is doing investigative work and we can't, you know, step on their toes. I think we could maybe see more data being released in the future, but as Rachel said, it's a, it's a small data set and we're happy that we're able to even, even share this much. That's helpful. Thank you. The movement of the data from ONC to OIG for investigation 
obviously as a transition to the enforcement uh, phase. Once a complaint comes in, I think we covered you covered this already, but unless it's clearly a mistake and shouldn't be in that data set, all claims then go over to the OIG, correct? That's right. Yes, we share all claims with OIG. And then OIG has the authority to investigate, and that obviously could lead to the OIG potentially taking enforcement action. Although, as mentioned earlier, we only have a proposed rule from OIG so far, not a final rule for actual penalties. That's right. Separately, you mentioned that ONC might use its authority to review the complaints about potential information blocking that happen to be against health IT developers related to your authority under the Certified Health IT Program. Right. That's right. And that authority is in place, as it were. It's not awaiting a, another rule. The certification program is up and running to the extent that you know they can look into information blocking claims, or we, I should say, since it is all one ONC. So we're able to do that through the certification program starting now. <laughs> And could could a complaint, information blocking complaint, be used to trigger a direct review of a certified IT developer? It could. It's any you know certification criteria could be used to trigger a direct review, which oh. is ONC's process of investigation. Yeah, down could- down in the weeds, I'll just say down in down in the in the detailed weeds of the certification program, we have certification criteria which really apply at the level of the specific product, the specific health IT product. And it, you know, certification to, no, let's say the G10 API criterion provides some assurance that this API technology can actually do the things that, that the certification criterion requires. A lot of review of, I'll call it simple criterion nonconformance, is actually handled by our authorized certification bodies, but it can trigger direct review in some circumstances. Our direct review could also be triggered by the developer not complying with conditions and maintenance of certification requirements, which include the don't be an information blocker, don't engage in activities that are information blocking or otherwise needlessly impede health information and interoperability and exchange. But we all other conditions include you know, requirements to real world test the product to make sure that it's really still doing what it's supposed to do once it gets out in the field. In certain cases, to perform certain updates and upgrades to certified products over time, over a specific time frame. And conditions and maintenance would also include the communications condition, which says that the certified health IT developer is not supposed to be trying to enforce gag clauses through contracts that would keep, say, healthcare providers from expressing concerns that they may have about this for example, safety or interoperability of the developer's products. I just wanted to add a little bit of color commentary there and background of the sort of breadth of things that people could be experiencing that they could choose to tell us about in the context of telling us about what they think might be information blocking. And if that's there, if that suggestion is there, the possibility is there, it would go into our as Cassie noted, already up and running processes for reviewing potential signals. And if we, if we think we have a signal, you know, assessing whether it's a strong enough signal, it's time to start a direct review. So I might have cut Cassie off. What were you going to say? No, that's, that's great. I think it's helpful for folks to understand that the certification program really does have a, a very wide breadth of things that can be looked into. And if we see something that looks like we could do it, we do. So some enforcement could happen that way currently. The OIG enforcement against developers and HIEs, HINs is still yet to come, right? We haven't had any enforcement actions yet. And we don't even have a rule from HHS for disincentives for providers. Although this is my own commentary, I think we will get one at some point. uh, We had even the secretary of HHS say earlier this year that it was recognized as as an enforcement gap. So I think at least we believe that there may be um, some rule coming up or at least sometime in the future. But for providers specifically, that information can be reported to other agencies too, such as OCR for enforcement under other rules like HIPAA, right? I'll just say what it says in the statute as an example. I'll just crib from the statute. Why write a new one? For example, if OIG gets one of these claims in, they look at it and they think, gosh, you know, what's going on here we think could probably be resolved through consultation with OCR. 
they can refer that over to OCR, call them in for a consult. So it is possible that things that come in and they are violating or appear that they could be violating some other law that's already having an enforcement mechanism in place. Yes, it could flow to there. Yes. Since since it looks like, at least from the, the data we can see, that these might be right of access type of issues, a lot of patients are complaining and a lot of providers are being complained against. At least it is a possibility. The data may suggest that some of these are patients who can't get their records from providers, and that's why the complaints are being filed. And those would seem to fall right within the right of access initiative by OCR. I, I want to check to see if the OCR might take one of those complaints and then investigate for un under the right of access. It's possible. Yeah, it's possible. I, I do want to point out that it's possible. I want to point out another possibility to bear in mind, and, and I'm going to, it's a little bit of a long wind up. I've actually been encouraged by how many really activated and aware patients we've been able to reach. Other complaint processes that I've been involved with over the years, we've struggled to get enough awareness that we saw the volume of patient complaints we would expect. In some cases, given patients were the target audience, the only ones who were supposed to be complaining in some of these processes. But what we're seeing is really engaged patients. I don't really think that every patient across the United States is aware that information blocking is a thing any more than I think every patient across the United States today really wants immediate access to all of their EHI through a patient portal. I think we, we vary as individuals. That said, I think one thing that is very possible to see when it comes to information blocking is a spectrum of interference. In information blocking terms, we speak of interference, which would include not only prevention, but also material discouragement. It can include unreasonable and unnecessary delays. So interference and information blocking can cover an array of things that stop maybe just short. Some of them further short than others, but some of that you can have a situation where you are interfering with a patient's right of access, but you're not outright denying their right of access or, you know, dragging your feet for 31 days as would be necessary to be in black letter law violation of the right of access. You know, we do see patients complaining that they're not getting enough information. They're not getting it fast enough. They're not getting it easy enough. Without getting too specific, I will say that when patients are really engaged and they want their information, they are not necessarily going to be happy with something that passes the minimum required to say that, that you're in compliance with HIPAA. They don't want to wait 30 days. They don't want to have to come get a, a DVD. They just don't want to have to do that if they don't have to. So I think it is important to remember that it's entirely possible that you could get violations of right of access. It's, I think, stepping aside from the information blocking claims. I will speak momentarily to something that happens on our, you know, ask us a question portal. <laughs> you know, we do get questions from people who are actually concerned that their information was disclosed when it should not have been. So it's actually the inverse. They're, they're complaining that someone has violated HIPAA by oversharing. And we do send the folks with those questions like, hey, is it okay that this happened? We do send them over. And generally speaking, again, we're in the question portal now. We do generally ask that they go directly to OCR's online intake. And that helps make sure that they can go through the structured intake that OCR has put together and give OCR all the information they need right at the get-go to figure out if and how they can intervene and help that patient that may be concerned that their information has been overshared. That, that's really interesting and, and certainly is a good illustration of some of the actor side issues or covered entity side, at least for, for, for HIPAA covered entities of being between both requirements to, to protect the privacy and do so accordingly in accordance with HIPAA, but also don't overprotect it and share it, but don't overshare it. So we have seen some challenges, uh, certainly, and the industry has seen some challenges um, walking, you know, walking on that tight tightrope. What else is uh, ONC doing with this data? You know, you mentioned it's a database and there's a lot of information available that, you know, can be looked at and turned over. Is, is ONC doing anything else with this data other than just passing it on and using your parallel authority related to developers? To the extent that we do see trends or patterns in the complaint process, it can help us in many ways in, in developing better guidance, right? If people are complaining about things that probably doesn't look like information blocking, 
that helps us with our outreach. If there's things that, you know, we feel like, oh, we're, we're missing that, you know, we didn't get that covered in our last regulation. Can we look into that? Is that something we need to be doing? ONC really prides itself on taking information in from all stakeholders and figuring out, you know, where these friction points are, how we can help educate, how we can reach everyone who should hear about this and who it can benefit. We use all the information we get in the questions portal, in the complaint portal, all of it. We really do read everything. That's what I was wondering, really, will some of this data even make its way into future FAQs, for example? Certainly the questions we get in through our question portal, those get turned into FAQs all the time when we see patterns there of what is EHI now and what's going to happen on October 6th. That's definitely one of our most frequently asked questions. And we use those to develop FAQs. Yeah. There's really good information and it really, again, very glad we were able to have this conversation. I'm going to turn the conversation and the podcast back over to Nevedatha for some closing comments and questions. Yeah, thank, thank you all. I think it's a great discussion. It's good to hear how ONC is, is taking the information and reviewing it thoroughly and using it going forward. As we close, I just want to give Rachel and Cassie an opportunity to share any final thoughts. Is there anything else, you know, that maybe we haven't touched on so far that ONC would like to share with our listeners related to either information blocking generally or the complaint process more specifically? I'll start. I I think I might have left a little bit of a cliffhanger there about October 6, 2022, which is the date at which EHI that is covered by the information blocking regulation will expand from what is now sort of a more limited data set of just the data elements that are in the US CDI. Starting October 6, 2022, it will expand to cover any EHI to the extent that the information would be included in the designated record set. There's still some concerns from all sides about that, but we also know that we've done lots to give people time to practice and get ready for this. And I know patients are going to be really excited by that. Just getting all of your EHI is really, it's a huge step. We've come a long way. And I think I I just want to build on what Cassie's pointing out here. Folks have had you know, a lot of time to figure out how they're going to move this stuff. And patients are, that those who are really engaged are going to be really excited. I think the other thing to remember is if you're on the actor side, our regulations are set up under information blocking so that October 6th doesn't, you're not required to have all of the EPHI for that patient that would be in the designated record set and is not a psychotherapy note up and running available in any specific type of technology. It is a matter of you need to be figuring out and hopefully have figured out over this time. If a patient comes to you and says, I want, you know, something, whether that's a DICOM image or something else that is not currently part of the USCDI, how, you know, what's the best way, the most efficient way to get that information to that patient while making sure that, you know, it's properly protected right up until it's in the patient's hands and it's on them to protect their own information or how you're going to move with your trading partners and your referral participants. How are you going to move all of the EHI that you need to move between each other for continuity of care and so forth? We're not saying you have to have a particular way of doing it. That's point one. I would say point two is that I think there's an opportunity maybe particularly for for healthcare providers to help their patients understand in advance what they're capable of doing and and let the patients have a choice of what manner say consistent with the content and manner exception under information blocking would the patient like to get the information in if for example you cannot yet get a particular thing that they want into the portal. So there, there's a little bit of a, a, you know, an opportunity to just be candid up front and let patients know what you can give them when they're coming looking for their EHI and work collaboratively in a way that the patient doesn't feel obstructed and understands you're trying to get it to them and you're doing the best you can. But yes, those, those are just the two points I want to emphasize. October 6th is not a requirement that you have specific technology that you be able to do EHI access according to a particular technical standard. It's merely that interference with access to any of that EHI could be looked at. It's not just the OCDI version one anymore. I'm going to add one last thing, which is we talked about what a limited data set we have so far, and it is in one sense, but in another sense, we just are really heartened by how much participation we have seen and how many complaints we have received. And we hope that 
people continue to submit those complaints or their questions through the inquiry portal or the complaints through the information blocking portal. Yeah, I think that really highlights what we've talked about across the whole series that, you know, one of the pillars of this whole initiative was patient empowerment and patient engagement. And it sounds like you're seeing that through this process as well. So Rachel, Cassie, and Alan, I want to thank you each for the informative discussion today. It was a pleasure having you all on the show. I'd also like to thank the audience for listening to our special podcast series on interoperability. If you like what you hear today, please subscribe to the show. Diagnosing Healthcare is available wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you for listening to Diagnosing Healthcare. For show notes on today's episode, additional episodes, and more insights on trending issues in healthcare, please visit diagnosinghealthcare.com and be sure to subscribe on your preferred platform. The Employment Law This Week and Diagnosing Healthcare podcasts are presented by Epstein, Becker, and Green, PC. All rights are reserved. This audio recording includes information about legal issues and legal developments. Such materials are for informational purposes only and may not reflect the most current legal developments. These informational materials are not intended and should not be taken as legal advice on any particular set of facts or circumstances. And these materials are not a substitute for the advice of competent counsel. The content reflects the personal views and opinions of the participants. No attorney-client relationship has been created by this audio recording. This audio recording may be considered attorney advertising in some jurisdictions under the applicable law and ethical rules. The determination of the need for legal services and the choice of a lawyer are extremely important decisions and should not be based solely upon advertisements or self-proclaimed expertise. No representation is made that the quality of the legal services to be performed is greater than the quality of legal services performed by other lawyers.